Since 2007, uh, we have been facing periods of uh, price spikes in food staples. Uh, we have been facing in 2008 uh, extreme uh, price spikes, especially during the first months of, of 2008. In 2010, uh, since the crisis of Russia and the export bans imposed by Russia, we also start to experience again significant uh, increases in prices and also extreme increases in price uh, variability. IFPRI has developed a tool to identify periods of extreme uh, price variability. So what IFPRI is trying to do to support and, and to move ahead the agenda of the G20 and the action plan of the G20 and to support the concept and to try to better understand how to measure uh, price volatility is to come up with a model that will help us to do that. The first part of our model is a model for the dynamic evolution of returns. The second part of, a mo of our model is a combination of this model with um, extreme value theory to identify very high levels of returns. And the third part of our model is a statistical test that identifies periods of increased price variability. The model that has been developed during the last year or so has been focused in two essential things. The first one is to try to identify when we observe situations that we call price abnormalities. What a price abnormality means is basically that the price or the change in return we are observing today is a return which is has a very low probability of, of happening. For example, it could have a 5% probability of, of occurrence, which is a very rare event. That's why we call it a price abnormality. Let me bring an example. During the Russian crisis, uh, when Russia decides to put the, the export ban, uh, Russia is 11% of the world export shares of wheat. Automatically, the price increased substantially, creating a significant spike and a significant increase in the returns of wheat. When we look at what happened with the media, there was a lot of media saying that we were again in a price crisis. The problem was that in real life, we had enough stocks of wheat, more, uh, significantly more than what we had in 2008, and we also have enough production on the US side to be able to cover the gap that the export ban of Russia was going to put in place. Now, people thought that this was an, an increase in prices that will end in a significant price crisis. When we use our model and try to identify what was happening, in that period of time, as you can see in the graph that we are showing, when we do a zoom to that period of time, we clearly observe three price abnormalities, what we call three price abnormalities. This is events that are happening in terms of change of returns, which are very low, with a very low probability of occurrence, and which clearly explain to us that what we were observing was something very rare. It's, it's, it was a, a price spike that the probability that it will go down in the following days or weeks was very high. So let me talk a little bit about the model that we have developed to do this. In a sense, our model is a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool has to do with modeling, having a model for the dynamic evolution of returns over time. Now, any model that tries to explain the evolution of returns over time has to be flexible enough to incorporate all of the salient characteristics of the time series of returns that we have. So what we tried to do first was construct a very flexible, fully non-parametric model that explains the evolution of returns through time. Once we have that model, we move to the second leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool is devising a model consistent way of defining what extreme values of returns are, that is, what extreme price variability is. The way we did that was combining our non-parametric estimation of the model with extreme value theory. What that allowed us to do was to estimate quantiles of this return series that allows us to classify any particular daily return as being exceedingly high. Specifically, we could choose any quantile, but the results that we have are for 95% quantiles. That is, any daily return that exceeds our estimated conditional quantile is classified as a very high return. Okay? So that's the second leg of a stool, is the possibility of identifying these very high returns. Now, 
It is important to note that the identification of a very high return on any particular day does not allow policymakers to conclude that we are in a period of very high price volatility. All it gives us is one high return in a particular period of time. So we have to provide policymakers with a tool that allows them to identify a period that is characterized by an unusually high number of occurrences of these high returns. That brings us to the third leg of our stool, which is exactly the identification of a time span or a period of very high returns. The way we decided to do this was retrospectively. In other words, what we do is for any particular day okay, in which we observe a return, we look at the previous 60 days, that is 60 trading days that precede that day. Within that period of 60 days, we have an estimated number of returns that exceed the quantile that we have estimated with our model. We then compare that count of the number of returns that exceed that quantile with the expected number of returns. We develop the statistical test to verify whether the discrepancy between the count that we had of exceedances over the quantile and the expected number of exceedances is high. If it's significantly high, then we characterize that particular day as a day belonging to a period of increased price variability. We then move this 60-day window through the entire past history of returns and construct bands that are shown in red in the graph that you can see in our portal that give us periods of excessive return returns and excessive price variability. Now, policymakers can be confident that from a statistical point of view, these are periods of unusual price variability given past history. It is important to emphasize that what we are bringing with this tool, or bringing to this debate, is a consistent metric and way of identifying periods of increased price variability. We are not making as of now, any prescription of what policymakers ought to do once they observe this increased price variability, but to devise policies that mitigate the impacts in consumers and producers of high price variability, we need as a first step consistent metric and tools to identify these periods of increased price variability. Now we have the tool to be able to identify those periods. And that, by default, helps WFP to be able to have a first level global trigger where they know which are the periods in which they have to put a red alert or an emergency alert, under which they will then look in detail at the country level, which are the countries that have the most need and therefore have country level triggers to complement our global le level trigger to design policies through which they can deliver their emergency reserve.